Okay, here we go. Okay. From the top. You hit record? Already recorded. Already We've been recorded. recording for okay. three and a half okay. minutes. Okay. All right. That and that's how we start. Hey, internets! It's Jake <laughs> from Mini Terrain <laughs> Domain, and this is take two. Hey. Um, Carrie asked me just a minute ago if I was going to acknowledge my mistake. I did it last mm -hmm. year. I did it to a lesser degree this year, and I literally told Carrie that anecdote before we started. Mm -hmm. And then we got and I was what? like, I'll have to remind Jake. And we got I maybe to remind him. 15, 20 minutes into the actual gameplay, and I just glanced over and went, ah, crap. Damn it. So we took a Nothing quick break. Nothing important had happened yet. We were just about to get <laughs> it, the inciting incident. So it, it was, was all setting the, scene. Um, setting the scene. So at any rate, this is for us, take two for you. Hey. Welcome to Welcome. Scribes and Scrolls, the Candlekeep Mysteries. This is... Our interlude series, by now you've already seen the first one with Doc, a.k.a. Gary, or rather Gary, a.k.a. Doc. Um, I don't know where Doc ends and Gary Boy, the how about that thing that happened during Gary's one-on-one, -on -one, right? Wow. I cannot believe it. It was so wild and impressive and fun. <laughs> yes. So at this okay. point, Carrie hasn't seen it yet. I have not seen anything. <laughs> yet future Carrie will have already seen it and can respond in kind in the chat. Indeed. Because uh Carrie and I, as as we well, we didn't mention before we did. This is this is getting too meta. Carrie yeah. and I are the only ones that talk to our future selves through yes. the yes. stream. Um future and, Carrie. and we love it. Uh so yeah, um, uh, we're probably just furiously typing oh my gosh i can't believe this thing happened wow no spoilers future carry because not everybody oh. may have seen it yet yeah um Watch but anyway lights. as we did last year and we're doing again this year it is our interlude series we take the month of december off from 90 percent of the mtd streams all of our games go on on break to give everybody some breathing time and to enjoy the holidays if they celebrate or just to have a break for a couple weeks um and so we pre-record these uh, so we can delve into our characters a little bit more and learn about them. Uh, more often than not, they're backstory elements, um, but they're just, it's more things you don't have time to fit into a weekly two and a half hour game with five players so we can learn more about these characters. Um, so uh, with that, just a just a quick announcement or rather um well yeah an announcement and a reminder one you'll notice looking above carry there are no domain tomes uh because these are pre-recorded um and because they're not yet at candle keep it wouldn't make sense for there to be magical books that are aiding them um <clears throat> but if you uh follow uh you know if you if you subscribe gift subs resub um cheer bits all that stuff we will keep track of them gary and carrie certainly will and yep. when we return in the new year we will assign all of those domain tomes uh to scribes and scrolls accordingly maybe um, we'll finally be able to build up a bulk again we've been yeah. tragically woefully short well, on tomes when you build them up i've got to give you reasons to use them yeah. This is a good time to remind you that I, as the DM, can also receive limited edition domain tomes. Type exclamation point limited to see how those work. They're a little more expensive, but I can only have five at a time. And they're also a little um, bit more powerful. And the, yeah, they're, I can use five domain tomes to basically counterspell when the players try to make me re-roll with five tomes. Uh, so if I really want that character dead, you can help me make that happen. I can even project that onto you who donate these tomes to me. Oh, you really this want This one's that coming dead. from Tomiko. Dead. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You could call Tomiko out like that. They, um, well, you know what? Tomiko is a chaotic, wonderful person. Yes. And um, you know what? I think that's something Tomiko would do. Yep. Tomiko is a know. chaos gobbo. <laughs> okay. So the, the uh, last thing I want to mention before we get started uh, because we do this before all of our games is we remind you, uh, let you know that you matter. Your presence on this earth makes a difference. Whether you believe it or not, it's true. I've been very open and honest over the years with my own struggles with anxiety and depression. Um, and about a little over three years ago, getting close to three and a half, um, I finally found a therapist and 
Uh, she has helped me to learn more about myself and to, to learn how to deal with anxiety and depression. And I'm continuing to explore and learn things. And, and um, honestly, I think everybody should see a therapist at some point in time. I, I, I think uh, too many people, too many of us try to handle things on our own. Uh, and it helps to have somebody to talk to. Um, but the hardest part of that was getting started, figuring out how to find somebody. Uh, we try to make that a little easy for you. We let you know before every game, all you have to do is come into our chat, type exclamation point help, and you'll see a couple URLs will pop up in the chat there. They'll also uh, show up along the bottom of the screen here from time to time. Um, the first is findahelpline.com, a completely free resource. All you have to do is type in where in the world you are located and numerous resources that are regionally uh, applicable to you will show up for mental health services, domestic um, addiction services, whatever. You can find the help you need. Uh, additionally, you can check out find a helpline or excuse me, uh, take this.org. Uh, they have a glowing, li growing li and glowing. Uh, list of resources available <laughs> uh, that are constantly being updated. So please do check those out, bookmark them uh, for yourself and for a friend. Um, and remember, you matter. With that, I think it's time to play again some Dungeons <laughs> and Dragons. Hey! It's time. All right. We see. A landscape covered in snow. Far to the north. Far enough north that when the clouds and the snows are clear, you can see the mountain range known as the spine of the world. It's jagged mountaintops piercing towards the sky. The... Uh, entirety of this region is blanketed this time of year in much snow uh, as we are in the midst of winter. But as we turn to the foot of these mountains, we see the, the dots that are a village. We see thatched roof huts, uh, simple huts um, that are uh, they look like they serve their purpose of providing shelter and warmth, but they also look like if needed, need be, they could be torn down and transported. Um, we see that, uh, smoke billows out of, uh, several of these, uh, the, the peaks of several of these rounded, uh, huts from fires burning within. Um, we see, the bloodstained snow behind the butcher's hut with tanning racks with hides tanning we see the smoke house where whatever meat isn't taken and eaten uh, or cooked into stews and roasts and such uh, meat venison elk fish all hanging in the smoke house the scent of hickory or mesquite and smoked meats wafting throughout the village we see uh, tasks taking place throughout uh, as people are uh, repairing or making hunting traps snares um, fashioning nets uh, we hear the the pounding of metal on metal as the armor works to fashion um, Acquired metals from uh, conquests, armors. The, these these orcs don't take dwarven or elven or even human armor and just use it. They pound the orc signature upon upon it, tearing it and reshaping it and forming it to their their own bodies to put a pauldron here, or a partial breastplate here, or maybe a gauntlet. Uh, sometimes folding the steel over and over and fashioning uh, sharp-edged weapons. Um, there's another place where somebody is carving uh, bone and antler into uh, knife handles or arrow heads uh, and knife blades. 
as we sift through and we see children running trying to stay out from underfoot um, as many of the adults are working um, we cut to uh, an area a different part of this village within this village of grayish green skinned orcs wearing mostly hide and leather and furs um, there is one person who stands out amidst this tribe of orcs it is the teenaged 14 year old human girl Tira with hair the color of the sun where is Tira in this village during this day it's roughly around 2 o'clock in the afternoon mm -hmm. so just I would say just a little bit kind of off the beaten path um, there is there's one dwelling that's just a little bit larger than the others um and you would see outside of this dwelling, you would see uh, Tira. Um, she is has is not wearing the furs that a lot of people are wearing, um, but it's because she's working and she's hot. And so she is. You see a what looks like a tree, like laying off to the side, partially chopped off, and then a pile of wood, and then Tira with uh, the splitting stump where she is. Uh, standing out front of this dwelling and and splitting this wood into burnable wood um though she's not taking it to like the the big like communal pile of wood that a lot of the other orcs are taking their wood to it, this is a separate pile uh presumably to be used in this slightly larger dwelling as you bring your axe down splitting yet another piece of wood you hear the sort of rustling sound of the um, the wolf furs that are hanging in front of the door to this larger hut. Uh, you hear them sort of brushed aside. And a figure, though this, this particular hut is much larger than the others, the man who steps out is has to bend slightly as he steps out. And when he steps into the brilliant light of the day, he squints a little bit. And... <gasps> I was trying to nap, Tira. The constant splitting sound makes it difficult. <laughs> and Tira would, with another whap, um, kind of wipe the sweat off of her brow and say, Well... It would be a lot more difficult to sleep if you're frozen to death. Or would that make it easier to sleep? I'm not quite sure. And she would, like, turn around, put another log up there, stand back, and then just whack and split this one with that nice pop sound. You hear the snow sort of crunching under Gorm's heavy feet as Gorm, who is both the great chieftain of this tribe and has also served for the last couple of years uh, by his own choice as your sort of adoptive father. He walks around behind you. And when you go to grab another piece of wood, you see Gorm standing there. He has taken his fur cloak off Mm -hmm. Hang, just kind of toss it aside on this partially um, chopped tree. And as he does so, he just gives a stretch and these just rippling triceps, shoulders, triceps, biceps, one arm nearly half as big as you. Um, as he reaches down and just palms a big piece of wood and sets it I'm down. I'm sure one that would. Tira would have a hard yeah, time. Yeah, one with, you, you would have to definitely set the axe down and lift it. He just lift with my knees, not with my back. <clears throat> yeah, he just okay. reaches over, grabs it, and sets it down on the stump for you. And uh, Tira would kind of smirk and be like, "Well, I'm glad you saw it my way." And then pop, and then again, it just splits cleanly. Tira is very practiced at this by now. For a couple of moments, this continues, maybe four or five minutes. 
Garm says nothing. Just places wood on the stump for you. You split it. And then you realize he hasn't placed another log on the stump. Tara would kind of look at him and like shrug. You know, you can't spend all of your days chopping wood here, the homestead, by yourself. What are you doing out there with the others? The others haven't ever done anything for me. Why would I be out there with them? Hmm. Never done anything for you. Tell me, Tira. The venison that fills your belly. The furs that line your cloak, your boots. The leathers you wear upon your back. Did you kill all of those animals yourself? The fish that you eat. Did you catch all of them yourself? Did you build this hut? And Tira would kind of like kick at the snow and not make eye contact. She's like, no. We watch out for ourselves, yes. But we watch out for the tribe as well. We work together. I never see you with the others your age. Uh, well, last time I tried to spend time with others my age, all it got me was a split lip. A <laughs> black eye. That's just orc children being orc children. You'll have a lot more split lips before you're done. <laughs> Ronica is your cousin. You may not be related by blood, but you are related by the tribe. You should spend more time together. No, yeah, well, he's the one that gave me the split lip. I don't think it was just old children being old children, but... And Tira... Tira is thinking back to that incident specifically, and... She understands what Garm is saying, but she also has never told him, like the things like that Ronica calls her and like the way he treats her it's it's not just kids being kids and, he, and she would just kind of shrug I think you've chopped enough wood for today Tira <laughs> Ronica and his friends they're cooking something up I don't know what But I think you should see if they need help. All right. And and Tira would be halfway through the sense, like, are you sure we have enough wood? And she would turn, and this pile of wood is up to her shoulder. Like, it's, it's <laughs> plenty of wood. And she would be like, yeah, I think you're right. I think we've got enough wood. And she would take her, she has like a, like a kind of a cloak, um, it sort of runs from one shoulder to like the lower part of her ribs and she would take it off of a fence and kind of like put it on and um be like well i'll be back um if i'm not back just assume i'm dead it's been real nice being in your house and she would just kind of start walking down the street you just hear he just kind of gives a little bit of a uh <laughs> and as you start walking away you hear this heavy thunk as a piece of wood large enough. It was from the larger base of the tree that you just left for much later. Mm -hmm. He, at, Gorm actually has to, Garm actually has to take this with two hands and set it down. And you see him take the axe and just whack. And you hear this loud <laughs> as this massive piece of wood is just split down the middle. Tira would swear for a second that she hears it like echo off the mountains and she like looks back and she tries not to gawk, 
because she wants this all to seem just business as usual, but at the same time, she thinks in her head that she is glad that he has taken a shine to her. <laughs> she does not want to be on his bad side. So you begin walking through the through this village, this this uh, arrangement of of huts and stuff. Where do you go to look for uh, Ronaker and his friends? Um, I imagine that uh, being they're still teenagers. They're a little bit older than Tira, but they're still more or less kids in this in this tribe and. Um, uh, Tira would look for them somewhere that's kind of out of the way. Um, the spot tends to be out behind, like, one of the big dining halls. The big dining hall. Um, just because it is off to the side and not a ton of prying eyes. So. And I'm going to draw attention to this joke again, even though we made it in our it was first very attempt. Funny the first time because <laughs> we're pretty much we're pretty much caught up, getting caught up to where where I realized my mistake. The suspense it but builds. What was funny that I said before and I'll say again is that you basically just created the fantasy version of orc teenagers hanging out behind a Wendy's uh, smoking and drinking. A lot of fear pressure. Yeah. A lot of fear pressure. Um, a lot of... Oh my god. I love and it. so we canonized that uh, yeah, it's not necessarily rebellious in in the way we would think of it today. It's pretty common that orc teenagers would get up to this kind of stuff. Uh, there's gourds of um of uh fermented yak milk and um these sort of seasonal <laughs> yeah these sort of hand hand carved uh pipes with like a just a really mild um weed uh and and again like you you said it's not like it's not like like bad kids it's not like freaking greasers it's it's it, Roniker is viewed pretty highly in this yeah. tribe because because of who he's related to and that he's garm's nephew it's he is he is looked upon with favor generally by most and he's big and strong and he just doesn't like tira and i think the where the rebellious part sort of comes in is at this age roniker and his two uh, we'll take a moment to to describe these these two companions with roniker um the first is uh, Rigar, who you have known since you've been a part of this tribe for for now um, two or three years. Uh, Rigar has always been a constant companion to Ronaker. He's smaller and thinner, and he is Ronaker's yes man. He is that yeah 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 yeah, and that's exactly what he's like. That's he's he's sort of just the yeah the toady he's just like whatever Roniker says he'll he'll back up you catch him on his own and he's he's which is hard to do to catch him on his own uh but he's nowhere near uh as formidable when he doesn't have uh Roniker um to hide behind uh the other one is an orc girl uh also similarly you are all right around 14 15 uh Yeltha Yaltha is a strong, capable, uh, very athletic teenage girl. Um, she is currently uh, Ronaker's um, companion. Uh, more, you'd say they're sort of they're they're going steady, as the orcs say. Oh, uh, um, Brenda and Eddie. And uh, she doesn't wear his class ring, but she wears like a a, a severed finger with a ring on it that he gave to her or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say his varsity jacket, but I it's, gonna, it's, yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's a uh, a, oh, yeah. a leather vest that just has like a uh, this is the roving wolves, isn't it? Roving wolves. Yeah, it's so there's like an R like, stitched into. <laughs> it's got a chenille R. <laughs> That's um, amazing. That's amazing. But uh, everybody knows that uh, this is not. She's not a hanger on. Uh, she's with Ronaker because she chooses to be with Ronaker. Um, and she, unlike Rigar, she is perfectly formidable and capable on her own. Um, so these are sort of the, the, the three companions uh, that are out hanging out back of this. Um, and I think 
what I was starting to say before I described them all, the sort of the rebellious thing that's happening here is not that they're drinking and smoking behind the longhouse. It's that they're not doing the work they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, but like you said, Ronaker is somebody, uh, has a, has a, gets away with it. He gets away with it because he's the sort of thing. And he just sort of gets away with it. Yeah. Right. So you walk up on the three of them, uh, sort of mid joke. They're all sort of laughing. (laughs) Of course, Rigar, I imagine he's just like the, (laughs) he's laughing really, really obnoxiously loud. I hate him already. Um, yeah, and Tiro would walk up and be like, Oi, good afternoon, cousin. Yelta, Riga. Uh, your uncle suggested that I come help you with whatever important, very, very important work you were doing today. Said you might need a hand. And she would kind of like smirk almost at these shiftless sons of bitches. <laughs> Just kind of like, because she's actually out there doing the work. Ronaker takes a takes a pull from this hollowed out gourd that has this milk in it and uh, he just using his shoulders pushes off from where he's leaning against the back of the longhouse takes a big drag on this pipe and steps right in front of you towering over you by close to a foot he just looks down at you and goes Right. Little white rabbit come to see <laughs> how she can help us. Oh, yeah. I mean, I already cut a cord of wood today. I'm sure you've cut two or three. You are very capable and strong. He takes another pull, this time holding the smoke in for a minute. What we're up to is none of your business. Yeah, yeah. You're just a little white rabbit. You can't keep up anyway. And then uh, Yaltha, she comes walking up alongside, uh, brushes past you, sort of not not forcibly shoulder checking you, mm-hmm. but she mm-hmm. she brushes against you deliberately. And stands right next to Ronaker, putting one arm up on his shoulder. And she takes the pipe from him and, and, and takes Yeltha it. is the only one in this trio that Tira kind of like semi respects. And she is obviously reasonably cautious of all of them, but she's almost a little bit afraid of Yeltha. As well you should be. Um she takes the pipe from Ronaker and takes a hit. And for a moment, she, as she takes the hit, she just turns to Ronaker and blows part of the smoke in his face as he inhales it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then she goes, I don't know. Maybe we should bring the rabbit with us. Maybe. Just maybe. She's finally ready to earn if not real tusks the spirit of the tusk and Tira would kind of like think about this for a second and be like well what are you up to for 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 just a second dropping that kind of air of know-it-all-ism and really genuinely curious for a second of what they're up to. All right. Ronaker says, looking at uh, Yalta like, she's the one that says, yeah, maybe you should come, but he's like, yeah, I think it's a good idea. We'll take you. You've heard no doubt about the invisible stag. And Tira, you, I assume, has. 
know that the invisible stag is amongst the hunters of the tribe it is a um it's sort of the the hunters talking about the big the big massive deer uh that's out in the woods that nobody can seem to catch they call it the invisible stag because it is an albino deer that gotcha. is almost impossible to see in the snow okay and then tira would kind of like lift her chin up a little bit and be like yeah i've heard of the invisible stag who hasn't we've found its tracks and we know that it's just a few miles outside of the village and we're gonna go and take it down all right well that sounds uh sounds like an adventure if my uncle thinks you should come with us who am I to defy the chief's wishes? And, uh, yeah, Tira would kind of puff her chest out and not really say anything to that, but kind of be proud for a second that it, that uh, Garm thought she was capable of coming on this if he knew that this is what they were up to. Like, this all feels... And I can't imagine it's going to end any way other than I feel like think it's going <laughs> to. But it feels to Tira like the closest thing to acceptance that she's kind of come. Yatha looks at you. Yeah. I think she just might be ready. And she hands you the pipe. And I, I take a, a big drag and Tira like really tries not to cough. <laughs> but <laughs> I think I would like you to make a we're gonna have a roll. Make a constitution hey, make a constitution saving throw. Oh boy. With my <clears throat> uh mini Tira stats. So con saving throw, huh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, let's see, because I'm proficient, so it's a plus two. Da, 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 da. That's an eight. <laughs> oh damn. Oh boy. Uh, yeah, you try not to cough. You're just immediately coughing all over the place. And... Ugh, Tira's not a smoker. <laughs> She's uh, a baby. She's just a baby. Rigar falls off the log he was sitting on, laughing so hard, falls back into the snow. Shut the fuck up, toothpick. <laughs> <laughs> and we do sort of a Star Wars wipe uh, as we cut to... It's a little bit later. And uh, Yaltha, Ronaker, and Rigar um, have their... Uh, ha have furs on. They've got bows and spears and they've all grabbed uh, white, um, uh, white or light gray uh, wolf skins um, that they're using to almost like a camouflage. What? How does Tira dress for this hunt? Tira doesn't like have anything that's that <clears throat> color, um, so she would just kind of wear what she has. She has like boots that are like almost like wrapped in fur like imagine like like the the um oh god what were the guys that worked on the wall called in freaking game the of night's Thrones? watch the night's watch uh like that kind of like just a lot of fur just to stay warm but hers is um it's just brown it's it's kind of it's dark unfortunately so she's kind of sitting out like a spot on this snow but as best you're sitting there, standing out. Ronaker, and you're already outside the village, and Ronaker just goes, ah, It's bad enough that I can smell you. You're going to give away our position. What do you want me to do? This is Stand still. 
And he grabs a water skin mm-hmm. and he starts uh, splashing water into his hand and he starts rubbing it on your furs. Mm-hmm. Mm. And he just starts doing this really quickly. Oh. And then he goes, yeah, this will work. And shoves you backwards into the snow. Oh, what a dick. Okay. Um, and I, as I'm standing up, like ready to... Like fight him tira catches a glimpse of herself and sees that like what water he spread on her has already like frozen to the like tips of this fur and it has also stuck a lot of the snow on like yeah yeah that'll work and no shit i know how to hunt and tira would just kind of keep her mouth shut all right pissed but like wanting to go along and do this big thing so I would like you as you begin your group moving through the snows it's we're going to say that it's it's about 3 o'clock now Mm -hmm. and you know that you have this time of year you have maybe 2 or 3 hours of daylight um, because right now the sky is actually, you know what? My favorite thing to do is you get to make all three rolls. Oh, you're going to roll three D 20 and we're going to determine, uh, what the weather, oh, what is. kind of weather we got. Oh, yeah. Lordy. I like, okay. I like to leave the weather, uh, up to, uh, chance. So we'll be drawing on the, uh, weather chart. Let's see what the weather is like as you head outside the village. So okay. first D 20, 14. Um, so it's going to continue with that. It's still winter, so it's probably in the, maybe the high 20s, low 30s. Mm-hmm. So uh, Fahrenheit. So, mm-hmm. um, it's cold, but not freezing cold. Uh, it also makes the snow a little bit wetter, um, okay. and heavier. Uh, next one is for wind. Was a 20. So I wasted a nat 20 on freaking wind. Um, it's fine. Fortunately, because the temperature is uh, is that sort of normal uh, for the season um, and just a little bit uh, on the warmer side, the snow is heavier. It's not blowing around. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, because this is a strong wind, uh, your footsteps, any stealth checks are going to be with disadvantage because there's now a thin layer of ice oh. across the top. So you definitely yep. get that sort of... Yep. Uh, one more roll. And an 11. Um, but it's not snowing. Uh, so it's just a heavy wind. That also means, in addition to your, um, your stealth checks being at disadvantage, any ranged attacks will also be at disadvantage because the wind Uh. will take your arrows and spears. Uh... Okay. So you know it's you're in trouble in that sense. It's you've just amped up the difficulty. Damn uh, it! And no. this this is not like just a freak wind that suddenly picked up or anything. Yeah. You are heading into a region of uh, sort of. There's actually a couple ridges from the spine of the world that that um, stretch down into this mm-hmm. area that. Since your tribe has has settled in here for the winter, and occasionally you set up camp uh, in this area, um, they call this uh, region the Fingers of Grumsh, uh, where these ridgelines stretch down in, and they form these natural channels for the winds from the mountains to come down into these valleys. So that's the weather as you are heading forward. So now I would like you to um, to make stealth checks. Uh, I am going to make a stealth check with Veronica and Co. God bless America. F and F. Okay. Well, it's not that bad, I guess. Okay, I got a 12. The other one was a nat 20. That's why I'm angry. So, 
as you begin moving, just naturally shifting into that, like if it's a video game, you've just suddenly gone into crouch mode. And, yes. <laughs> uh, the, the rest of your companions all go crouching. Push B to go, you, to go crouch. Even, even amongst the winds that are just, you can hear that sort of... You can hear the creaking of trees as they're bending against the wind. Um, you, over all those sounds, you can hear this of feet in snow, and you realize it's coming from Ronaker, Rigar, and Yaltha. Oh. They all rolled single digits. Um, <laughs> yes! They're the ones that are making all the noise. And uh, Tira would... So, like, what's the marching order here? Like, are we... Is Ronaker in the lead, I assume? And then probably Yeltha and Tira kind of behind, like, Diamond. And then, like, Rhaegar in the way back. Yeah, sure. I was going to say, you tell me what the marching order is. But, okay, yeah. that. Um, and then uh, Tira would... Tira would um, be very quiet. Um, I assume maybe even like staying several steps on top of this snow because she is lighter and smaller than these and because the crust on top of the snow is so thick from this wind a couple steps she manages to just stay on top of this shell and she turns to uh, <clears throat> Yeltha and would just kind of smile and be like hell of a time to be a white rabbit and then kind of smirk and just kind of continue looking around and scanning the, the landscape. You actually get a smile from her. Awesome. Awesome. Girl power. <laughs> yep. Um, I would like now survival checks. Awesome. Okay. And I make this, yeah, this is not at disadvantage, correct? Uh, your survival check is not at disadvantage, but you, I think you have proficiency in this. I do have proficiency. But you, you don't have any other bonuses. Correct. I think you're at, like, what, a plus two on this? Correct. So that's a 15 for Tira. Okay. Um, you notice that as you are moving through this area known as uh, the Fingers of Grumsh, that Ronaker and Rigar are scanning around like this. Mm -hmm. Like they are looking for something that they're expecting to be there and they can't find it. Got it. And you, what'd you say you got a 15? 15. Um, you look over at Yaltha and you see that she has seen the same thing that you see. Uh, up ahead through the trees, you see that there are breaks in the snow, that something has come through here. Um, you see tracks. Okay. And uh, Tira would kind of like, would reach up to Ronaker and like tap him on the shoulder and then like, like motion if he turns around. Does he turn around when she taps him? He does so in an irritated way, but he also knows not to snap at you or anything. He just he goes, would... <laughs> she would do this and then she would like point specifically at where there's tracks and he looks over and he okay he does see them once you point him out to them he sees he sees them and then he goes and immediately starts going to yaltha and and uh rigar and motions for them to head up and around on the mountainside. Okay. And he points at himself and indicates he's going to go straight. He wants you to move okay. down around, which will kind of take out around yep. the edge of the wood line. Okay. Basically, he's going to go down the center, and he wants you guys all to kind of come around. Okay. So that's what I do. All right. I would like you to make another stealth check. Ooh, I got real lucky last time. I feel like my luck's running out. Oh, that's... Wow, that's still not that bad. Um, that is... A... Da, 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 
a 10. So, average. You're definitely getting into the crunchy snow now. Um, and this area, besides being sort of in this windy area at the base of the trees, there are a few leafless trees, quite a few leafless trees. They're sort of, uh, because of the wind and the way the surface is, there's a lot of flecks of black bark and dark brown bark and broken, uh, tips of limbs and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and as you're moving along, uh, you can kind of looking over, you can see where uh, Ronica is moving up, um, through the trees and he's kind of moving from tree to tree and you can just make out the other two only mm -hmm. because you know where they are as they're coming up they're around the side. they're farther away than, yeah. than him to me, right? Okay. And you see as you are continuing to kind of flank and, and keep your eyes on the others to kind of keep your spacing. Um, first off, make me a survival check. Okay. See how well you can keep track of these other three. Okay. 13. Okay. Um, yep. That is a D12. Hold on. <laughs> I said I was going to use this, and I haven't used my... I'll save this for... No, by all really, means, use D12. <laughs> no, I'm, <laughs> See who I meant wins. <laughs> the, the Skull Dice Tower. I haven't been rolling oh, on that. I'll skull save that for tower. when it matters. Uh, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you <laughs> see that... choices mean nothing! <laughs> and you notice that... Uh, you see Ronaker immediately as... He, you're, he's, you're sort of in this low area coming around. He's a little bit yeah. on a hill... The other two are even further up and you see Ronaker go down on all fours and is sort of moving forward towards the edge of this hill. And he looks first to the left to Rigar and Yaltha and he makes a motion. I realize you can't see my hand. He makes a motion <laughs> stop. to stop mm -hmm. and then he turns and looks at you. And he makes a motion to continue to sweep around. Okay. And you see as he's down, as he reaches back and pulls his bow off. So he sees it. Oh my God. Wow. Do you continue okay. to make your way around? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And Tira's like heart is racing, but she's trying to just like stay calm and like remember all of everything she's been taught from Garm and her Dirkhead, her actual dad, and like just everything is all coming together. I would like you to make one more stealth followed by survival. Alrighty. Uh, wow. <laughs> Tira, damn. Um, stealth is a uh, da 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 da. That's a, a 10. Oh, okay. For her. And um, survival is, uh, let's see, survival's an 11. Okay, perfect. I heard you, by the way, when I almost said nine, I heard you go, Ugh. I heard you get a little freaking excited. And I, oh, don't I'm like already it. happy with these very low rolls, okay. <laughs> <laughs> these very average, <laughs> perfect. Okay, so that was your your stealth was a what again? Stealth was a was a ten. It was a ten. So that's and survival was an eleven. Okay. Okay. You begin. You you make your way around, and you see this area. There's one of the uh, the very tips of one of these things known as the fingers of Grumsh. Mm -hmm. This this ridge line sort of trails down and kind of works its way around, um, creating sort of a high point, which would be uh, sort of in front and to the right of you. Mm -hmm. And you see this area that's probably about 60 feet in diameter, where to your left, sort of up 
a little bit higher, maybe about 15 feet up, is this rise between a couple trees where you can just make out Ronaker. <laughs> and then just past that, kind of a little further up, you see uh, Yeltha and Rigar are moving along and they're, they're stepping in a way that you know they're walking on the side of the hill. Okay. And they're moving towards like a tree. You even see Yeltha reach out and grab uh, Rigar to kind of help him along as they move into position. And you are moving into this sort of open area. And I would like a perception check now. Oh boy. All right. Oh, shit. It's a five. Luck done run out. So you see. <laughs> You can kind of see these, uh, there's places where, one of the things that's both beautiful and dangerous about winter is that it blankets everything in snow. Mm. And it can turn what would be an otherwise harsh looking landscape into something uh, quite picturesque. Um, The dangerous aspect is that um, a lot of, Things that could be troublesome get covered with snow. So what looks like a harmless snow drift could be uh, a jagged, um, broken tree. Uh, it could be concealing holes like dens to various animals or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, or it could be covering an open area under which is ice that because of the warmer temperatures isn't as thick as it should be. Oh. As beneath your feet, you hear. And Tira looks down. That's the first thing. Yeah. The second thing is you see there are a couple of these places where the snow is sort of mounded up. um, And you actually can see like one of them probably about 50 or so feet away. Uh, you see where just poking out of it is the sort of jagged edge of a tree that probably the weight of the snow knocked over. You can just make mm-hmm. out that slight uh, shape of it underneath this blanket of snow. Okay. And then to your right, about 30 feet away, is another uh, mound of snow. And as you step on the ice and you, you hear that cracking of breaking through the surface crunch of snow... Yeah. And then you hear that. You also feel just the slight give. Get, oh, God. <laughs> you see one of the mounds of snow rises. Oh, shit. And as it turns, you see a. All you see in it initially are these two dark slits that as they turn you can see almost a jarringly bright yellow of its eyes and the only reason you can make out the rest of its face is its entire muzzle around the fur and then kind of going across the crown are feathers And you see a sharp hooked beak as a snowy owl bear turns towards you. It's muzzle red with blood as now that it's turned, you can see an elk lying in the snow. It was completely blocking it where it was feasting on this. Oh my God. And that's where I want to know what you want to do. Oh my god. Okay, so how how close is this thing to Tira? About 30 feet. Okay, Tira pulls out her spear. She had her bow out up until this point, and she kind of like very swiftly, smoothly, but not trying to, to be like not panicked. She would like re-put her bow over her shoulder and take out her spear, and then just sort of start to kind of like see this thing and then like look up at Ronaker on the ridge and then like back Make away. a perception check. This bastard. He'll be he's gonna be freaking gone, isn't he? I know it. I just know it. 19. You turn to Ronaker. And Ronaker is looking right at you. 
and he makes whatever the orc version of is as I you see the, uh, <laughs> that's yeah. where it came from it's, it's, it's just, they originated that's just it. it it's called the the tusks of grumsh <laughs> got her got her <laughs> oh my god yes that, that's oh canon god. now yep the gotta make sure we tell ricky that double tusk bitch. <laughs> that's awesome you get yes, both tusks of grumsh you get the two tusks of grumsh that's that needs perfect. to be a shirt. I don't know if I can get away with yes. that. But. Yeah, well, you might. <laughs> That's pretty original. Amazing. Yes. Okay. Wow. So, yeah, he's giving uh. you both tusks of Grumsh. And uh, you see that where Rigar and Yaltha had moved to, a little higher, they, they kind of position themselves up a little higher. And you now see that they are standing on an area. It's sort of a, a little bit of a cliff ledge that they clearly seem to have known was there because they're now standing up and they're moving further away towards where uh, Ronaker uh, mm -hmm. is heading. Um, I'm not even going to make you roll insight. They led you directly to this owl bear. They knew exactly what they were doing. Now, this owl bear is... This is like D&D &D grizzly bear. Yeah. This yeah. thing you're you're talking probably a 1500 pound bear that has this sharp beak. You can see where it was just ripping apart this yeah. elk. This yeah. beak can tear can can splinter bone. Um this is the kind of thing that usually a full adult hunting party has to work together to take down. You are a 14-year-old girl. What would you like to do? <laughs> Man, um, so, okay, do I, based on my walking in the, the, hmm. I will tell Kira you this, would... I will tell you this, uh, based on the, <laughs> what, where you're, just to set the scene just a little bit yes. more, because yes. of the cracking ice, you realized that you basically were led to a uh, a pond mm -hmm. that Ronica and the others knew was there, but okay. it was completely covered by snow. That's okay. why everything is clear here. Mm -hmm. And the reason the snow, the ice probably cracked a little easier is it's what's closer to the shoreline. Okay. So you're not terribly far, but you don't really know how far. Okay. Uh, you rolled low enough on survival. That's how you were able to kind of get out on there. And you you can make the assumption that the owl bear is either on thicker ice or isn't actually on the pond itself. Uh, so here's what Tira would do. She would survey kind of this clearing, which I assume is like, yeah, she just has this clearing. And she would want to move like imagining that if the clearing is a circle even if it's not tiro would want to move like to the opposite side of the circle like if, if so the opposite were, like, side of where you are is going yeah. to be the mountainside where the others went up on the cliff so that picture it less less like a circle and more like a u you like came in from the open end of the u okay up here at this top to the north is the mountainside the mountain to the to the left to your left is where Ronica mm -hmm. was to the right yes. is sort of a little bit more rise and some trees and sort of the direction the owl bear probably came from okay so Tira is essentially knowing that this is probably a pond now that she can kind of she wants to essentially try to put this pond between herself and the owl bear okay and just kind of at all the while keeping her spear like up She's going to frickin' make a break for it, but she wants there to be an obstacle that this thing, if if it does start taking off across the pond, she thinks maybe it'll fall in and give her time to get away. Um, so, yeah. So, what are you doing exactly? So, what I'm doing is I'm putting, I'm trying to put as much clearing between myself and the owlbear. Does it appear to see me? Oh, it's looking right at you. Oh, boy. Okay. 
So Tira would keep her spear out. She would be kind of shifting away and then, like, again, putting this space between herself and the owl bear. And then as soon as she feels like she has that space, she would she would run. I just need to... So you're moving... Are you trying to move back the way you came? Or mm-hmm. towards so where Ronica I, was? I just okay. need to know what direction so it's okay. It's no, I understand. I understand. So this is the cliff edge. Yep. This is where I came in. Yep. Where's the owl bear? Uh, that would be, yes, sort, sort of on that side. And then towards okay. your thumb is where Ronica was. Towards my thumb is where Ronica was. This is a and Michigan this, thing. We, ad, we adapt yeah. it to however <laughs> we, we have need. To, yes, of course. Any situation <laughs> can be the, the hand map. Um, so Tira would move off to where, kind of where, as far as, as far this way as she can and still be able to exit this way. Okay. If that makes sense. So I can't obviously go through the mountain. But. So, yeah. So the first thing I would like you to do is make a survival check. Okay. Uh, that is a 17. You know, based on the way the ice broke, that at least if you follow any of your previous footsteps, you're more likely than not going to break through. Okay. You know, with that 17, you know that it's likely that this entire pond is dangerous for you, and there's no way it could support this owl bear. Perfect. Now... I would like you to make a I'm going to let you do this with advantage either a uh, mm, dexterity or athletics check as you it's less about using the power of your athleticism and more about knowing how to shift your weight and step as you just body science yes I got it all right um, that's going to be a 22 athletics. Okay. As you take your first steps, the owl bear does this sort of, oh, <laughs> it stomps towards you with its front feet and you just see yeah. feathers and fur sort of ripple. And as it <laughs> half growling, half hooting, you see it sort of rise to its hind feet and it is now standing probably about 12 feet tall and it and you see blood and even some of the raw meat that was in its in its beak just sort of flying out um and it just sort of stands there as you start moving yeah so tira yeah continues this way and then Again, as soon as she feels like she has put the pond between herself and the owl bear, she would want to frickin' turn and run. Just bolt. You... The best. She's pretty sure she's gonna die. <laughs> like I'm, she's... I'm gonna see... Whoops. I'm gonna see if the owl bear is going to attempt to chase after you. That's gonna be... I'm going to call it survival. The owl bear, seeing you move across, it kind of shifts for a moment. Uh, it actually drops back down to all fours and with one of its powerful front paws, pushes this easily 200 pound elk, oh, just shoves it back about 10 feet. There's a smear of blood and spray of blood across the snow as it does so. Wow. This owlbear sees you as a threat trying to scavenge its meal. Okay. So for that's its first thing it does. So now you're at a position where you could turn and run. Now, so before you do that. Yes. With that survival check, I'm going to kind of give you a little piece of information that Tira would know that Carrie probably knows as well. Trying to outrun a bear is a very bad idea Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because bears can run very fast. fast. Yep. So I'm going to just give you that piece of information before you actually turn and run to see if that's what you really want to do. Because Tira is also 14. She's a baby. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, so Tira sees this thing kind of squaring up. And for just a second, she, instead of like this, like, ready stance she has been having with her spear, she sort of stands up straight and just kind of is holding the spear down to her side. And uh, she's pretty resigned to death at this point. Like, she, this is, there's not a ton of good that can come from this situation. And uh, she uh, stands there and she's like, well, what are you waiting for, huh? And she just... As soon as you open your yeah. mouth, this is the first you've spoken since you've been here. Mm-hmm. The owlbear, immediately you just hear, uh, 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 as it slams its front feet down, and it just goes, oh my God. and it is going to attempt to cross the entire distance to you um here it brings her spear back up again <laughs> i'm gonna have you roll me a d100 we're gonna use my sliding d100 scale oh boy there is a there is a 25 percent chance that the owl bear doesn't i'm gonna call it 20 20 percent chance the owl bear does not fall through the ice Okay, I got an 87. If you end up within 10 of what I rolled, it does okay. not fall through the ice. Okay, what did you roll? It's rolled a 91. Oh, you're kidding me. Oh, no. The Tim's owl bear stars today. <laughs> charges at you, and you now see as it's charging that the snow, but you can also see water as it's sort of uh, it is slowed down because the ice is breaking underneath it. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, the breaking ice is making it difficult terrain. Okay. So it's actually going to be able to move 20 instead of 40 feet. Okay. As it's coming I towards imagine, you. I imagine this gives Tira just an extra half second to think. And she turns behind her and looks and see, is there any like logs or anything on the ground, like right behind her? Anything like that? So or rocks. Where you've sort of moved, you're now nearby where the rise went up, where okay. Ronaker had set up, and you can see now from this position that the snow kind of comes over a little bit like a shelf. This was okay. sort of the edge of this pond, and there's places where over time it's sort of eroded down okay. that there are rocks and trees that have sort of fallen in that are mm -hmm. tightly packed that you might be able to fit into if you were looking for a space to kind of get back in and behind. So here's what Tira would do. She sees this. She sees the owl bear coming. She would want to jam the butt of her spear in a place where it's like braced. And she would sit there and essentially wait for this thing to try to pounce on her and hopefully dive right into this spear and once it has, I don't know. I, so how about we stop it there and then so see what happens? Just to just to clarify, are you moving into the hollow space or are you staying in the open? I'm staying in the okay. open until he pounces, <laughs> and then I want to hold. Okay, on to so the you're bracing sure. yourself. Yeah, essentially like a pikeman would. With so like we're gonna play it this way then, uh, because you've essentially are holding an action. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yes. You are going to, it's going to continue its movement, um, which now it will be able to reach you. Um, and you're going to get advantage because you've taken the time and braced yourself. Okay. I would like you to make a spear attack. Oh, uh, what do I get for a spear? What's a, what's a spear's bonus? Um, it'll be your strength bonus. Just my strength bonus. Yep. Got it. Okay. Here I go. Ooh. Um, so that's an 18. Okay. That is definitely going to be a hit. Uh, spear does, is versatile and you're basically bracing it and holding it with two hands. So it'll do 1d8 mm -hmm. plus your strength modifier damage. 1d8 plus strength. Wow, that's nine points of damage. Okay. I got him good. 
So you feel as this owl bear comes charging at you, splashing ice and uh, and snow, and you just brace on the bank. It comes lunging in at you, and it's almost like it's at this point now. It's kind of its hindquarters fall into the ice a little bit as it, mm-hmm. but it's the shoreline, so it's not very deep, and it kind of pushes at you, and it starts to take a swipe. Um, and as it's leaning into you, and that's when your your spear pierces into it, mm-hmm. um, it is going to uh, it's going to attack you. Okay. Um. Well, just just a bite. He's got a whole elk. For a right second there, that was almost a nat twenty. Oh well, well <laughs> that would have changed the campaign yeah. significantly. It's not really Tira. It's. It's it's a hologram. <laughs> it's Mira. Mira, it's, it's it's an alias. Um, so it takes a swipe at you. Uh, your AC is twelve. Yeah. So it does hit you though. Uh, with a thirteen. Okay. Um, what did I say? You have fifteen hit points. Fifteen hit points. Let's, let's see what happens here. Um, okay. That's one. Oh no. Uh Tira. This owl bear, you drive this spear up into it. You can feel the warmth of the owl bear plus the wet and cold of the of the the wet fur and feathers. Mm-hmm. As it comes at you and takes a slash, you also feel hot warm blood running across your hands pouring down coming out of the and you feel its weight as it's forcing the spear deeper inside making roll another d8 plus your strength okay oh, shit 3 okay um you feel an intense pain across your shoulders Mm -hmm. as one of its claws comes across ripping into your shoulder and partway through your chest you hear uh, what you think is your shoulder dislocating might be your clavicle breaking you take 14 points of damage oh no oh no I am at one. Yep. I am at one hit point. Yes, you are. Um, oh my god. Okay. Now. Okay. <laughs> no. I would like... That's like the way I say one. I would like... Um, Yikes. You to roll another d100. Oh lord. Oh god. Okay. I have my number. All right. My number's a 14. Okay. The owlbear has just... You're pretty sure it's... It almost feels like like your arm might be dislocated, or might be almost torn off. Oh, jeez. Uh, you're not sure. I can't tell, and I'm afraid to look, yeah. frankly. Yeah. Um, like- as you're sort of it's sort of the shoulders you're you're bracing this whichever way you're bracing it Mm -hmm. uh they got ripped into um and then uh hold on i just lost the thing i had up back up a second um ah where is it just had the freaking thing up hold on while Jake is looking something up, be able free to check us out on spring.com. Spring.com. We have t-shirts, hoodies, and so much more. Spring.com. Just search mini terrain domain. Um actually you can type exclamation point merch in the chat and the link. Exclamation will pop point up. merch gives you the link right to the store. You can get great shirts like the one I'm wearing. Tira. Yeah. You see as you see as the um the blood is just running down both yours and the owl bear mm-hmm. are mixing together mm-hmm. 
your vision is swimming. Uh, you are struggling to maintain consciousness. Mm-hmm. You see just over the owl bear's shoulder. You see the wind is blowing across, pushing some of this debris from the, the fallen uh, branches and stuff. And though there's no loose snow to be blowing around, you swear for a moment you see like a swirling eddy. There's a Disney swirl? Of snow. Cool. And this snow picks up and begins to swirl and coalesce into a... Uh, it's almost hard to see because it's, it's sort of bluish white with the white on, on the background and the sky is sort of gray. Mm -hmm. It coalesces into a large spectral spear. And you watch as... Let's just see here. Wow. Whoops. As the... Okay. So that's definitely... Let me see what's the old there. Let me see. Yep. Um... As it seems to fly from, it's uh, what, 15 feet in the air behind it. And you just see mm -hmm. it as it forms, it just suddenly, it seems to sort of pull back as if an invisible hand is th getting ready to throw it. And then, shoom, and you see as the owl bear is opening its mouth to take a bite at you, you see this spectral spear go. <laughs> through the back of its head. Oh my God. And the tip of this spectral spear is right yeah, in front yeah. of your face. Right, oh my God, yes. Make a constitution saving throw. Oh, jeez. Con save, there we go. Okay, it is gonna be, uh, uh, that's gonna be an 11. You hear and see the spectral spear pull back out of the skull and the blood seems to cling to this spectral weapon mm. and the owl bear hot more blood is just pouring over you and your vision begins to wane mm -hmm darkness pressing in from the sides as you continue to lose blood mm -hmm. and you swear for a moment you see the silhouette of a hunched humanoid figure walking into your vision behind the owl bear wow. and then you lose consciousness For a moment, a moment, an hour, a day, you don't know. There is just nothing. There's blackness. The last thing you remember is cold and wet, and the hot blood spilling over you, and the pain of your broken arm. Now you, your senses slowly begin to come back to you. You hear, well, the first thing is you feel warmth, the warmth of a fire nearby. The one side of your body is a little bit colder, the side facing the fires where you feel that warmth, but it feels contained within an interior space because you feel an ambient warmth as well. Mm. You hear the crackling of the fire. You smell some kind of a venison stew, but you also smell something like cider and blood. You feel a dull 
but intense pain in your shoulder. Which shoulder is it that would have been? It was probably Tira's left. Because okay. her her other her right hand would be like kind of under and in the spear. So you feel that intense, dull pain. And even just that attempt to move, you feel as if your shoulder and your entire upper arm is bound to your body. Okay. Uh, even moving, flexing the fingers of your left hand mm -hmm. uh, causes pain to shoot up. Okay. Um, your mouth is dry. And as you... Your eyes flutter and you open them. You can see that you are inside a cave. Okay. There's a fire burning nearby. You can see the light, the yellow orange light dancing around, creating lots of moving shadows. You're laying on a uh a bunch a gathered bunch of furs um hmm. that they're piled up in keeping you comfortable there's um an animal fur that's been stuffed with probably hay or straw or something that's sort of a pillow that your uh head is sort of braced against just in the little bit as you look around you can see just on the other side of the fire in this cave which looks to be a bit of an alcove it's probably at most uh 15 feet crossed there's darkness on the other side of the fire you get the sense that maybe there's more of the cave but you can't really tell okay and on the other side of the fire is a figure hunched over and you can hear the sound of uh chopping um and uh you can sort of see the movement like somebody's working at a table doing something um they're sort of hunched over they've got furs um and you can see sort of woven into the furs as they come down are uh bones of small animals have been woven in this figure hunched over you also hear coming from them just a subtle they're just sort of humming to themselves while they work uh you definitely hear um what little bit of words that kind of come through you hear uh two things in it one uh it's a woman's voice and two um they speak in orcish mm. very well and they kind of shift a little bit and they pick something up and you see the figure turn, and now their face is completely illuminated. Uh, you see a very old orc woman. Skin wrinkled. You can see the hints of what was probably once a more muscular build. Uh, but there's, there still looks to be some power there. Um, but age is definitely taking its toll on this body. Um, and you can also see where, though they wear no kind of patch or anything, especially as the fire lights up, you see the very clear, empty eye socket of their left eye. Hmm. And you know who this is. I do. You, this is somebody who is part of the tribe, though she, whenever the tribe moves, she always tries to find a cave or somewhere outside of the village for isolation. Mm -hmm. This is Tomf Tamar or T Tomf Tower. I'll put that in our side chat so you can have that. Cool. Okay. This is Tomf Tawar. 
the Eye of Grumsh, which is essentially your tribe's uh, shaman. Um, and and eventually, so like Tira would eventually kind of like turn and uh, and she would like try to talk, but kind of nothing comes. Ha, no, don't don't try to speak. No talk. And and Tira would keep trying, but it, first, nothing's happening. First, you must drink. Drink, yes. And she comes over and kind of kneels down. She has on this tray, um, there's a bowl uh, that has, uh, you can smell this um, thick, heavy venison stew. And uh, she's just chopped some onions across the top of it and um, a couple other fresh veggies um, on top of it. Mm -hmm. And um she also has another wooden cup that's right next to it she goes fast fast i must drink drink and she brings this cup towards uh towards your mouth and you get the heavy scent of mold cider oh, oh mold cider i thought you said mold cider for no, a second i'm like gross. mold mold <laughs> She's a shaman. I trust her, but dang. Okay. So anyway, I uh, I would like sit up, and I would I would take it. Well, I would. You can try to sit up. Uh, pushing yourself I, up is going to be very difficult. Uh, never mind. I don't. I stay. Where I, I'm at. I imagine you try to sit up, and she just reaches out barely with like this wrinkle. Like she's the kind of old where you can see the knobs of each knuckle, and yeah. this bony hand just barely rests on you and stops you from getting up oh no here and she just starts tipping the cider yeah just I in little it. bits letting you take sips mm -hmm. there's a uh in addition to the sweet um and uh slightly sour um taste and smell of the cider um and the spices that are blended in there you get a, a an extra sweetness that um has a medicine feel to it mm -hmm. um as she continues you're just taking these small sips continues to um feed this to you until you've drank and uh drinking drank <laughs> you've until you're drunk Wait, we're all friends um, here. <laughs> yeah, un until you have drunk half of it um and then she sets it aside and she goes now eat eat and taking a wooden spoon, she begins to feed you mm -hmm. little bits of this stew. Yeah. And she proceeds to do this. Anytime you try to talk, she immediately interrupts you. No, no, no. Um, and for a little while, you, against uh, your will, you just drift off to sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a combination of the medicines and the, the cider and just the exhaustion of the ordeal you've been through. Mm -hmm. So the next, however long you don't know that passes, mm -hmm. it's in bits of waking up and seeing, uh, seeing Tonf Tuar, um, tending to you, um, until there comes a time where you open your eyes and she is sitting to the side of the fire. She's sitting crouched, like her knees are kind of coming up like this. You can mm -hmm. see bare feet with long nails sort of digging into the cave floor as she's just crouched there and she's holding a very long pipe. Yes. Um, and she's just looking at you with her one good eye, just... Yes. You should be able to talk now. I, um, how long have I been here? It's been three months. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
of Tawar is playing with your mind. <laughs> it's been a day. Is, uh, is that owl, that owl bear is dead? Yeah. Yes. We did a number on it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Tell me, yellow-haired one, why were you taking on an owl bear all by yourself? Have you a death wish? Well, between you, me, and the fence post, uh, we were out there looking for something else, and I, I get a hunch that we weren't really looking for the something else. I think I've, I think I've been had. Ah. Chief Garm's nephew. This fence. I saw them. Yeah, Little yeah. shits they are. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Tira would laugh and then be kind of cut off by like a shot of pain and, and she'd be like... Yeah, that yeah, shit's all right. They've never been quite this bold. I'm not sure if they were trying to kill you or just scare you. Well, keep it to yourself, but they did both. They almost did both. She leans forward and looks down at your bandaged arm and you can see now that there are fresh bandages on your mm -hmm. arm mm -hmm. and while you're in a lot of pain it doesn't hurt anywhere near as much as it did when you first regained consciousness mm. Mm. it will be difficult to keep this a secret you will wear the mark of this the owlbear and leave a scar. Yeah. If not here, and she taps right on your arm where it hurts the most. Ah. And she's she's tapping, she's taking this pipe and she's sort of tapping with the mouthpiece. Yeah. If not here, mm. definitely here. And she taps the center of your forehead. Yeah. Well. I mean knowing them they probably went back and told them that I just died on the trip shit maybe I shouldn't even go back <laughs> let Veronica and his friends have a victory you would just give it to them and Tira something like something she hasn't felt in a long time it almost feels like when she would be sparring with her dad like this kind of pridefulness sort of out of nowhere it's it's it hits really hard very suddenly and she's like well now that you put it like that nah there it is <laughs> there that right there and she's pointing again with the pipe you are human it is no surprise you know this Ronica reminds you all the time, does he not? All the time. Little white rabbit, they call you. <laughs> Very unimaginative. If only they knew what Tira the Sun Mane was capable of. <laughs> that there. What you felt just now. I saw it around you like like a a spark of lightning in the air right before the storm before the lightning strikes and you could feel it in charging the air and your hair stand on end how do you feel it sometimes sometimes there is an anger in you but you you suppress it why Anger makes you stupid. It makes you make mistakes. <laughs> what? What has Garm taught you of Gromsh? I know, 
about Gramsh. You know of Gramsh. You don't know about Gramsh. Yeah. Right. Tawar will tell you. Do you know why this eye socket is empty? Um, no. Because no. I plucked my eye out. Why the hell did you do that? <laughs> Because that's how Grumsh shows fever to some of us. Ah, for the magics, I had an aptitude when I was younger, and I sought to honor Grumsh. Our god Grumsh had his own eye taken from him by the elven god Corlon. <laughs> Grumsh shows fever. To those of us who would be willing to pluck out our own eyes, and that's what gives me my attunement to his powers. Because I trust and believe in the power of Grumsh. Did you know the story of Grumsh? No matter, I will tell you. Whatever you've heard is diluted. I imagine Tira has several times opened her mouth to say something, but then just immediately, yeah. oh, no, no, no. <laughs> in, in ancient days, the gods gathered to divide the world among their followers. When Grumsh claimed the mountains, he learned that the dwarves had already taken them. He laid claim to the forests, and Corlon's elves had already inhabited them. Everywhere that Grumsh wanted had already been claimed. And the gods, they laughed at Grumsh. <laughs> Foolish gods. And you know what he did? Do you know what Grumsh did? Never mind, I'll tell you. <laughs> Grumsh, he got... Angry. <laughs> Grumps responded with a mighty bellow, a roar of pure rage that shook the very bones of the gods. <laughs> he took up his mighty spear and he raged. Ah, with the power of an orcish god, he laid waste to the mountains. He set the forests aflame and he carved great furrows into the fields. <laughs> Such... It's the way of the orcs, Grumps proclaimed, to take and destroy all that the others would deny them. That is why to this day's orcs wage an endless war against humans, dwarves, elves, and other folk. Grumps did not sit by idly and wallow in his despair at how the other gods had treated him. No. The legend of Grumps is simple. Sometimes you have to get angry if you want to get things done. <laughs> and there, there I saw it. For just a moment, behind your eyes, not the wide, fearful eyes of a frightened white rabbit? No. I saw the anger of Grumsh. It's in you, girl. <laughs> you just have to let it out. And Tira would kind of nod and have taken in this story, and she would, she would kind of look, and then for a second she would shake her head, and she'd be like... Why would Grumsh choose me? I'm not an orc. What? Why give me his favor? Why not Ronica? Or why not somebody bigger or stronger than me? Strength is not always in your muscles. It is definitely never in your lineage. Ronica's. He claims strength because he is the nephew of the great chieftain. That means nothing to Grumsh. Deeds matter. You have the anger of Grumsh within you. 
You simply have to learn to let it out. Okay. Ronica and his friends. If you don't return, they will grow thinking that they have the power of Grumsh within them. They will go on to lay waste to villages and pillage, and Ronico could possibly become the next chieftain. But will he have earned it? Who knows? More importantly, who cares? Will you be a tribal leader? Probably not. You're human. But will you go on to do great things? It is possible. There is much possibility in you. You have to stop hiding from opportunity and stop holding in your true feelings. You want to be accepted into this tribe? Yeah. Then you must accept yourself first. And then uh, Tira would kind of nod down and it's like, well, whatever's left of myself, that is. There is much for you yet to learn, young Tira. There is much that you don't yet know. And only you can discover those secrets. I'm going to give you something. A token of our time together. And she stands up, and you just hear just this snap, crackle, and pop of her <laughs> joints as she rises to her feet. And oh yeah, she, she shuffles. Tries her best not to like wince. She, she shuffles over to a uh, um, just a rough-hewn uh, travel chest, mm. and she pops open the lid, and she's kind of moving things around. <clears throat> And she's muttering to herself and she goes, ah, here it is. And she comes over to you and again crouches down next to you and she says, hold out your hand. Tira holds out her right hand, which is like, I imagine, opposite of... of <laughs> you hold out your hand and she immediately grabs it with one of her hands and she holds her other hand over it and she places into your hand you feel something cold mm -hmm. and smooth even I don't truly know what this is but on the day the Garm took you in, proclaimed you his ward. Something happened. And she kind of lifts her hand to peer inside. And, and as she does so, she's blocking your view. Yeah, I, and Tira's like trying to see. And what you see from her one good eye, you suddenly see a pink light reflected in a just a dot in her eye something is glowing ah just as i thought she moves her hand away there is a smooth round stone roughly the size of a gold piece wow it has a hole in the middle okay the light that is illuminating is partially going around and occasionally it's, it's an unbroken line that goes around the surface and then suddenly makes a right turn and goes around the edge of this coin-shaped object. Oh. 
basically a continuous line that moves all the way around uh -huh. and the entire line is glowing with a pink light. Okay. She would look and she's like, well, what is it? It's pretty. Pretty, yes. But what? I must admit, even I don't know. But it started glowing like that. And the day Garm pronounced you his ward and welcomed you into the tribe. I have had it. Since about six winters ago. Huh. I will show you. Come. And mm -hmm. she holds out her hand to help you stand up. <laughs> Tira would like put this stone away and then like help like let her help me up now that Tira is standing how tall is this woman compared to Tira she is her, so her face is basically even with yours but that's only because you now see that she's got a very pronounced humped hunch in okay. her back if she were capable of standing up she'd be a good oh. foot or more taller than you okay Um, again you can see the remnants of a once uh, powerful like like all orcs, she was probably, in addition to being a shaman, she was probably a capable warrior once upon a time. Sure. Sure. Um, as you stand up, she goes, ah, there you go. And she claps you on the arm that's bandaged. Oh. And surprisingly, it doesn't hurt that much. That's quite a bit better than a day. You said I've been here a day. And she grabs at the um, bandages and kind of looks in and she goes, yes, yes, that'll heal nicely. And she undoes the bandages. Your arm and up through your clavicle, you can feel the pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's definitely scars on your arm where the claws ripped through. Mm -hmm. And the, re the, the rest of the skin, though... Uh, is very pink and fresh looking. Um, and she just says, good food, good drink, good medicine. And uh, huh. she beckons you to follow her. She takes up a staff. She's got a, a staff that uh, is about six feet tall. And at the top, there's, um, there's like, uh, animal skins and uh there's actually like uh rabbit and squirrel and uh even snake skulls that are sort of woven in and sort of dangling it makes sort of a rattly sound cool. as she begins moving i imagine as she starts walking out tira is still kind of mesmerized by her shoulder and how much it's healed and then she kind of snaps out of it and tira like jogs a couple steps to catch up and then it's just walking with with Tom. and she leads you outside and you see now the sky. It's one of those winter days where it's a little bit uh, brisker. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably probably in the 20s. Mm -hmm. But the sky is azure blue. Mm -hmm. Not a cloud to be seen. You can make out the uh, to the north, the spine of the world um, in stark contrast to the blue sky mm -hmm. uh, the snow seems to almost glow with the light of the sun um, and she leads you out of this small cave um, and you can see where the snow's packed down and you can see where she's had wood split and yep. um, based on just what you can see of the mountains and everything you, you gather this is uh, the exact location you're not sure but you know you're probably only a few miles away from, uh, like probably maybe a mile or two away from the main camp. Wow. Um, and she starts leading you along the snow where there's various areas where the snow's been packed down from her walking around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then she leads you to an area kind of going around behind this cave and starts going down... Uh, this little bit of a 
um, depression in the ground. Okay. And as she comes around, she just says, kind of leaning back to you, talking and saying, Everywhere we set up camp, I like to find a place of seclusion outside so I can be closer to Grumsh and hear his words of wisdom. And I don't like people prying into my business. And she said, about six winters ago, I found this place. I was drawn to it. And as you start making your way down and around this depression, you come around the side and you can see now, <clears throat> if there weren't snow here, this, this would look probably like almost like a crater. Um, okay. It's about 40 feet across. Mm -hmm. And you can see in the middle of it what looks like a uh, about a, a 20 foot tall 15 feet in diameter obsidian black spire but the top of it rather than rising to a point you can mm -hmm. see jagged edges mm -hmm. where it looks like it was broken off of something You're, there's no mountain near here but this looks mm -hmm. like the very peak of a mountain was broken off, turned upside down, and dropped from a high height. Wow. Huh. And okay. you can see you're following places where she's come down multiple times and come to this place. Uh -huh. And as you walk around, you get to the uh, right, the path leads right down to the bottom of this crater and where this spire is. And the snow pack stops there. Hmm. I haven't been inside in at least four winters. But this is where I got that token. This is a place of power. What power? I don't know. It, it, it resists my ability to know it. And Grumps seems to have no concern for it. My magics do little to penetrate its mysteries. Well, Go inside. Yeah. And you see there is an opening. It looks, again, it looks like uh, this opening is probably about two and a half feet wide partially buried in the snow and the top part is slightly at an angle but it's flat it looks like a window that's been cut into stone but okay. upside down okay um tira would kind of reach into her pouch and have that that uh stone out and just hold it in her hand and kind of like clutch it like tightly and she would kind of shrug at tomf and make her way into this gap you duck down under and climb inside. And as you step inside, you, you're standing on where there's this sort of obsidian stone and some, some snow and debris from outside to sort of uh, come in through the window. Mm -hmm. um, and you it goes down a little ways, maybe about five feet. And then you're standing on sort of a gently sloped surface mm. um and you're in a space that is about 10 feet in diameter and you can see off to one side there's an opening that looks like it leads into another area mm. uh tira would be too curious to not go check out the other area <laughs> you move inside and you find what looks like um, a sloping floor uh, that goes down. And you realize if you follow this, you'll go a little below the surface of where you came in. Mm. And it only continues. It's, it's basically like a hallway. It's about four feet wide and leads to another chamber. And inside this chamber, you see that... There are, there's debris of broken obsidian. Um, you can see what looks like about uh, 10 feet above you, 
um, was what was probably a floor um, where things, whatever was in there when this thing fell, uh, there's remnants of broken furniture. Mm. And um, there's pieces of this broken obsidian that they're chunks, but where one chunk is broken and rough like rock, two of the edges or three of the edges are smooth and there's a there's a clear corner edge to it. They look like they were deliberately carved pieces that were then broken. Broken. Yeah. In amidst all of the debris, you can see the remains of an ancient looking skeleton. Ancient in that the bones are uh, perforated with um, they, they become very brittle and uh, porous um, almost bleached white in this space mm -hmm. and you can see that any semblance of any cloth that may have once adorned uh, this skeleton you can see that there are um, especially up around the where the rib cage is the skull has been crushed by rock uh, but you can see that there's bits of metal and leather that has managed to survive a little bit, though it's very aged. Gotcha. As you step into this place, I would like you to make a wisdom saving throw. Ooh. Here is the wisest of all the things. Okay, here I go. <laughs> that is a nine. Okay. You feel where you are, having moved, you know, below the surface, mm -hmm. there's a, any sound you make seems to instantly be absorbed. There's sort of a muffled nature to this space. Mm -hmm. It in with the skeleton, it feels very much like a tomb. And then you feel something almost electric in the air like mm -hmm. Tomf was mentioning like the charge of in a storm right before lightning strikes mm -hmm. and you feel the inexplicable anger course through you mm -hmm. and as that anger sort of rises to the surface you see all of the times over the last couple of years that Ronaker in particular and his friends have toyed with you. That they've deliberately tricked you in seemingly innocent tricks, but there's always an edge of danger to them. And you see now what you missed when you first came up on them and started talking to them, you see the exchanged glances as what they were planning all along was to lead you to this owl bear. This whole thing was deliberate. You also see all of the times that even other adults within the tribe, people, the further you get from the circle of Garm, you see every time people give you sidelong looks, you've maybe grown to acc accustomed to them and started to ignore them. But now it's as if when you pass, you linger and you hear the orcish words they use that are curses against you, that are uh, harsh comments that more than you've ever recognized before, large parts of the tribe see you as nothing more than Garm's pet. There's people wondering how much longer you'll survive. Um, and it's, you, you again, have this memory and vision of Veronica and friends and what they, they led you to a trap that could very well have ended in your death and should have ended in your death. And then as this rage begins to bubble up inside you and it's you, you sense this almost 
uh, pinkish violet light at the edges of your vision, you suddenly, boom, like being, it's almost like you're shoved out of your own body. Mm -hmm. And you see for a moment a glimpse of a great city. A city that stretches for uh, probably a, a mile in every direction. And what looks like a wall surrounding this circular city. You see spires of obsidian rising 50 feet at intervals all around, rising up. You catch glimpses of people, mostly um, humans, walking around in this city. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a... There is something about the people themselves that is so very foreign yet familiar to you. They're humans, but their hair, all of them have very carefully styled and clean hair. Uh, men and women alike have uh, almost shiny hairstyles pulled back into thick plates or... Um, that's just slicked back, pulled into a single ponytail, or very short haircuts. People don't wear animal skins. They wear elegant looking robes with complex geometric runic patterns embroidered into them, embellished with gold and silver. Um, you see visions of people on the streets that are helping one another. People are shopping. Um, you see what looks like carriages, but there's no horse pulling them. They seem to just to hover along. You see elements of everywhere that you look, the city made of obsidian and anywhere that you see some form of almost magic taking place, you see these geometric runic shapes in lines that just make sudden sharp turns or a curve coming back in. Sometimes a couple lines will go up, form around, come back down, fill in the circle, all of it pulsing with this pinkish light running through, including these spires. And then you see something happens that there's a sudden, almost like an earthquake. And you see people begin to run, are running and screaming. You start seeing these in glimpses. And the entire city begins to list. And you see now, as the city tilts, looking out over the edge that's tilted downward, you can see in the distance, far below, miles below you, you see the peaks of mountains. You can see lakes and rivers. And you see buildings beginning to topple. People are being crushed under debris and killed in the streets. And on the low edge, you watch as a building falls and hits a whole section of this perimeter. As you see half a dozen of these tall spirals break off falling. And you get this sensation of falling as you begin to slide towards the lower edge. And suddenly... Instinctively putting your hand out, you feel cold obsidian stone and you're in this spire standing next to this skeleton where your hand touches the walls from the edges of your fingertips, moving in complex geometric lines. You see pink energy. <laughs> as the interior of this space lights up and then sort of moves away from your hand and just sort of then the whole place goes dark again and you feel that almost not quite exhaustion but that sense of exhaustion almost as the rage just suddenly leaves you 
And all of this happens in the space of a few seconds. What do you do? Tira's like looking at her hands. And she's looking at that stone that she has. Is the stone is tracing that pinkish energy. And you're just watching as it just sort of... And fades to huh. just a smooth, polished stone of obsidian with no... You see no physical sense of where these lines were. Sure. It looks like a round piece of obsidian with a hole in the middle. Tira would kind of take one last look around um, just to see if she sees anything else. Uh, this skeleton, what it's wearing, does it look like armor or just clothing? Does it look like the clothing I saw the people wearing in this? It looks thing? like the remainder of the embellishments you saw on these fancy robes Okay. Um, that uh, in this vision, yes. Tira would kind of be curious for a second but then at the same time kind of overwhelmed and nervous about this place and she would kind of start to make her way out back to back to uh, Tom you step outside and Tom Tawar is standing there crouched like she was in the cave she's holding this staff and she's just taking sort of maneuvering it so that the very end of it she's just tracing just meaningless scratches into the snow. Huh. That was... I, I saw things. I Some of them I, I knew. And some of them... I, it was a city. Mm. It was a part of it. It was a floating city of, of, of rock like this. And, and Tira would kind of like not know what else, how else to describe it. And it fell. I, I don't know what to make of it. This is something you will have to find out. Grum speaks not to me of this. It is not a orcish. It is not a orcish concern. But it definitely has something to do with you. Huh. Yeah. I suppose so. Now, you have something that Ronica and the others do not. Mm. Something that mm. sets you apart. Mm. Take that. And take the anger of Grumsh that boils beneath the surface. Unleash it. Make that little shit bleed if you have to. <laughs> Kira would smile at first, like with kind of like this anticipation in her eyes, but then she would she would smile like softly, genuinely, and she would say thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Because of your help. Tomph Tawar will be eating owlbear for weeks. <laughs> Take this. You've earned it. Throw it at Radica's feet. And she hands you a sack that the bottom is soaked with blood. Cool. And oh. Peering inside, you see the head of the snowy owl bear. Yes. Yes. You awesome. earned this. You had it as good as dead. I just finished it for you. That's why I'm keeping the meat and the feathers. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get a trophy. Thank you. And and Tira would, would reach forth and, and put her hand on, on Tomp's shoulder in sort of that like orcish way of like respect and give her one last nod and Tira would start making her way back to camp. She's kind of had a chance to like orient herself and sort of knows which way to go again. And... and 
you make your way back to the camp and it's much like before the smells of the of the smokehouse and the sounds of people working around the camp and as you walk into the camp you begin to hear people this pounding of hammers and other tasks that are taking place slowly stops as you walk back into town Hmm. and people are gathering around you see a couple kids take off running and a few minutes later you see Garm step out from the direction of, of your hut but you also see opposite Garm Staring in disbelief, you see Ronaker with, with uh, um, Rigar and Yaltha, and Ronaker is staring like eyes wide, mouth agape. What do you do? Tira would, as she's kind of walking, she would reach into this bag and pull out the owl bear head, and she's just sort of holding it like by by patch of skin or feathers or fur or whatever and she would just kind of let the bag fall off to the side and she would continue to sort of march up and she is just kind of a, a sight still and uh she would um go to garm actually and she would present him with this trophy and be like our hunting party managed uh an owl bear, a snowy owl bear. This will make a fine trophy for the great hall, I think. And she would like put it on the ground by Garm's feet, and kind of like glance at Ronaker, but not say anything to him. A fine trophy, indeed. And he follows your gaze over to Ronaker and the others. But you are wrong. It is not a trophy of a hunting party. It is a trophy of a huntress. And he picks up the snowy owl bear. Uh, head by the fur and holds it aloft with his right hand he takes his left hand and grabs your arm Mm. and holds it up and everybody stares in silence and he says no longer will I hear anyone call Tira a little white Rabbit. And that's where we're going to end the session. That's, oh my <laughs> God. That is effing incredible. <laughs> that's <clears throat> awesome. Oh, yes. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> yes. Oh, it was so good. It was so good. It was so good. Oh, so much well, mystery. Once again, we get to see a little bit of, uh, we get to learn a little bit more about Tira and see see some of Tira uh, growing up uh, with the orc tribe and and awesome. seems like we've also learned a new mystery perhaps. Oh yes. Um, so secret. I will tell you that you can, um, however you want to do it, probably just as a as a note or whatever. Just note mm-hmm. that you have a, a polished obsidian stone. Okay. Uh, I'm assuming, but I will leave that up to you if Tira still has that in her possession somewhere. 100%. Um, there's no reason you wouldn't have it other than choosing voluntarily at some point to have gotten rid of it. So, Nope. Um, I would definitely still have it. So yeah, that's, uh, that's, that is oh my God, so Interlude cool. 8 of Ooh. our uh, Interlude series. Um, I don't know which one's coming up next. Uh, we're working out as of the time of the recording of this one. Mm-hmm. Every the, it, for at least the hundredth time, I've checked to make sure we're still recording. <laughs> oh yeah, good. I'm um, so glad. Are we? Are yes, we? We are still yes. recording. Okay, good. good. Um, 
<laughs> so there's still three more. Uh, not oh, sure man. what order they will come in, but I will tell you that we have uh, M as we're going to be looking at both Togo and Marta. Ooh. Um, we've got uh, Ricky, who will be looking at Vornushka. And we've got Dwight, who will be looking at Mizya. So those will be coming up. Misanthrope. Yep. We will be looking at those over the next three weeks. We'll be releasing those every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern, our same usual time. Um, And future versions of ourselves will be hanging out in the chat, most likely. Um, So, yeah, thank you, everybody who tuned in to watch this. If you did happen to drop any uh, uh, Domain Tome support, thank you for that. And we'll make sure those get attributed to the party when we return. Uh, future Jake is probably telling you in the chat who we're going to raid uh, after this. Um, so if he's not, get on it, Future Jake. Yep. And then, uh, so yeah, uh, thank you to everybody uh, who's hanging out with us in chat, whether you're actively participating or if you're somebody that likes to lurk and just listen, thank you. We appreciate you all the same. Or even if you are even further in the future watching this on VOD. Um, <laughs> and of course, a huge thank you to carry um without whom this would have just been me talking to myself for a couple of hours uh with that we're gonna go ahead and end <laughs> this stream the same way we end every stream and you can say it with me if you want <laughs> 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 <laughs>